legends, buried treasure, a possible murder, mystical occurrences, a ghost, a string of odd coincidences, and a religious artifact. These are the unlikely elements that come together to make up the story of Robert Lang Studios, an iconic recording studio in Seattle's Richmond Beach neighborhood. And of course I did I record the last uh, song that Kurt Cobain did, uh, You Know You're Right, the band Nirvana right. is in here. And uh, that was a pretty incredible thing. That was my last engineering session. Um, your, la your last my engineering last... was Kurt Cobain's last song. Correct, oh. yeah. yeah. Along with Kurt Cobain and the band Nirvana, a number of other rock legends have recorded at Robert Lang Studios, including Dave Matthews, Eddie Vedder, Alice in Chains, Presidents of the United States of America, and Lincoln Park. Entering the studio, the walls are lined with the gold records and signed pictures of the music greats who have passed through these halls. The story of Robert Lang Studios begins in 1975. It was that year that Robert Lang met Walter Westley Leonard, affectionately known as Dubby. The two shared a love of Harleys and a mutual dream to build a recording studio, and they quickly bonded. Back then, it was just like a little garage studio. It was like a 20 by 20 little box, you know, underground box. It was this room. Yeah, it was this room right here, <laughs> as a matter of fact. But there's kind of added on a little bit here and there. But I brought Dubby out here after the party about two three in the morning uh, brought him out here showed him the studio and he was really intrigued with it and uh, he was kind of into sound too he like he worked a little uh, band back in uh, a place called Buffalo Minnesota and uh, he had a group he did some sound for him so he was somewhat familiar with this audio stuff so he ended up spending the night I used to live across the street and this was owned by another gentleman back in the day where I was allowed to use the garage. Uh, There's nothing back then but maybe like eight cards in here and a little soundboard is real generic kind of situation. Bob and Dubby became fast friends with a mutual goal. They wanted to create a high-end recording studio. Before they could work on their studio, however, Dubby had some personal business to take care of. He didn't return to Seattle for two years. In 1977, Dubby returned ready to start working on their dream. And Dubby, every January, would get uh, $12,000 from his folks. And though his father was passed away, I think his father used to bootleg alcohol back in the day. So I think that's where the, the Leonards made their money at. So, and uh, Dubby didn't talk about it much, but I, I know that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And so he would always get this $12,000 every January. So it happened to be that, that when he came back from Hawaii, it was around January. And I think he was celebrating his birthday too. I kind of remember that because his birthday is uh, January uh, 10th. Up uh, to like Radio Shack, <laughs> you know, and bought a bunch of white connectors and a bunch of you know crappy stuff that you know <laughs> that you were kind of like, hey, no, no offense, Radio Shack, but you know, it's like all these you know kind of RCA cords and stuff, like adapters that we needed. So I thought right then I went, you know what, I, this man is like really you know, helping me out here. He, he didn't have to do that. So, as the story goes, um, he worked with one of my clients, I'll never forget, he was a Japanese fellow, his name was Yol, Lowell or Yol or something like that, but um, Dub worked with him and mixed five songs and then put the songs on cassette. And Dub forgot that the cassettes have leader tape. So. Part of the first oh. very cut of the first song, the first part of the first intro was missing. <laughs> and so Dub got extremely embarrassed and said, well, you know what, Bobby, this is not for me right <laughs> And so he just said, well, you know, um, hey, I tried, and uh, um, I'm going to uh, figure out to do something else. So. That something else was skippering a yacht for Seattle restauranteur Bill McCormick. In spite of it all, however, Dubby was still interested in building that recording studio, and it turned out that McCormick had deep pockets and an interest in Dubby's dream. What happens is that now Dubby was living on the boat for quite some time. I would say probably maybe eight months pass, and uh, Dubby still didn't, he didn't have any uh, uh, reason or just he didn't want to come back out and do the engineering thing again. But we had a mutual dream, and that was to build a studio. So as time goes on, now it's about, I would say, mid part, um, I would say 
May, June of 1979. And what happens is that um, Dubby uh, and Bill headed up to Orcas Island and we were talking to build a studio of the possibility of Orcas Island. And Bill got really tuned into this and, and uh, uh, we were talking about, you know, building this nice recording studio. 